Hello again, it's your friendly neighborhood host, J.T. Wheatley, back for another episode of the History Comics Podcast, this time with the first part of the history of Crack Magazine, the best ripoff of Mad Magazine. Ripoffs are common throughout history, and comic books are no exception. From the beginning with Superman, which caused DC to launch numerous lawsuits, some actually legit, to protect their character, whenever someone discovers a successful idea, others try to find a way to copy it. A prime example is Mad Magazine, one of the most successful humor magazines in history that only inspired numerous comedians but also publishers to make a try for it themselves. Even EC Comics, the Mad's publisher, tried to do it once or twice. Of all these ripoffs, the most successful was Cracked, which while it was never as esteemed as Mad, lasted for over 40 years earning the distinction of the best ripoff of Mad Magazine. Crack was formed as a ripoff of Mad Magazine, which first appeared as a comic book on October of 1952 from EC Comics and edited by Harvey Kurtzman. Originally the editor of two of EC's other premier books, Two-Faced Tales and Frontline Combat, Kurtzman was given this new comic to appease his demand for more pay, as he was envious of, uh, envious of uh, Al Feldstein, a fellow writer and editor on EC's uh, comics like Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror, Weird Science, Weird Fantasy, and The Haunt of Fear, among others. Kurtzman, a notorious perfectionist, was not able to produce as much as Feldstein, but EC's publisher, William M. Gaines, believed that a humor book would be perfect for him, as he had a keen sense of comedy. Kurtzman poured himself into Mad, but Frontline Combat and Two-Fisted Tales being taken over by John Severin, the future legendary cracked artist. Severin would even claim, since he shared a studio with Kurtzman and Larry Elder, that he had a large hand in helping the creation of Mad. As a 10 cent comic, Mad would become one of EC's premier titles and after 23 issues would later convert to a 25 cents black and white magazine or slick on July 1955 to avoid the Comics Code Authority censors. This change also came about as Kurtzman demanded it or or stating that he would walk, one of the many threats he made during his tenure at EC Comics. While Mad wasn't the first humor magazine, having been preceded by such books as Punch and the Harvard Lampoon, it's considered the first to focus on a satire parody element. Kurtzman would leave shortly after it became a, the magazine went black and white, as the final straw for Gaines came when Kurtzman demanded 51% ownership of the magazine to stay on. Instead, Bill Gaines finally told Kurtzman he can leave, and, uh, and uh, he would actually go on to work for Playboy publisher Hugh Hefner to produce the humor magazine Trump. Apparently, a deal was already in place before he, his demand was made to Gaines, and he ended up taking a lot of the mad artists outside Wallywood with him. As for Mad itself, Kurtzman was ironically replaced as editor by his rival that indirectly caused the creation of Mad Magazine, Al Feldstein. Feldstein was originally uh, heading up EC's attempt to replicate Mad's success as a black and white magazine with books like uh, Teller Illustrated and Shock Illustrated, as EC had canceled the rest of his 10-cent comic book line in response to CCA. These magazines would fail, thus when Kurtzman left, Feldstein came in as editor of Mad and would run the magazine for 30 years. It helped that Feldstein previously worked on another EC humor book, Panic, their own attempt at a rip- ripping off Mad, and decided to fill the pages with famous comedians like Wally Cox, Ernie Kovacs, and Bob and Ray. This would carry over Harvey Kurtzman's legacy as his creator and original editor, and Micheline Severin, John Severin's wife, said it best, Al Feldstein was Mad's head, but Kurtzman was his heart. Despite EC's inability to copy its success as a black and white magazine, Mad would inspire numerous ripoffs from other companies, such as Snafu from Atlas, the future Marvel comics in 1956, which Stan Lee edited, but that only lasted for three issues. Harvey Kurtzman's own Trump only lasted till 1957, ending after just two. Others, like Lunatical, Crazy, and Mars, also followed, but naturally failed as well. However, one magazine would finally take hold to become the second greatest humor magazine in America's history, at least as it liked to tout itself. Crack Magazine originated under Ace, Ace uh, Publishing, which was founded back in 1952 by Aaron A. Wynn as a science fiction publisher. The company would expand the magazines in 1957, specifically the sweat men's magazines that were popular in the 1960s to the 1970s. The magazine division would later be named uh, Condor, Candor, and originally under Ace, uh, editor Donald A. Woolham, but he would later hand off the duties to his new hire, Robert C. Sproul. Sproul's father, Joseph, was the circulation manager at Ace Books, while Robert originally worked at Hearst and Pocket Books before working for smaller publications as a field publisher, i.e. trying out different types of books to see what would generate a profit. This eventually led him to Ace and Candor, before founding major publications in 1958 with the intention of producing imitations of popular genre magazines on the stands like Westerns or Romance. 
Some of uh, major publications' uh, magazines were Saturn and, and Web Detective Stories, and Crack would be just another imitation, this time, of course, of Mad. Sproul was able to attract some top talents, such as Bill Ward, Don Oreck, and most notably John Severin, and was noted for not interfering in editorial decisions, as Paul Lakin would later recall, stating Sproul knew publishing, marketing, and circulation, but let the creators figure out what was funny and what, was, what wasn't. This was due to Sproul not being very creative himself, as his talent was copying other ideas, but not coming up with anything original. He left that to the talent he recruited, while Sproul was listed as publisher of Cracked, it was actually Bernard Brill who provided the financing for it from, it from his garment business. They originally worked on men's magazines before they formed Cracked using former Alice artists after the company imploded with Saul Brodsky, who served as the original editor. Crack magazine launched on January 3rd of 1958 with a cover date of March. The issue featured first appearances of the original Crack Max mascots of Veronica, Dear Editor, and Sylvester P. Smythe. The first issue also had artists like Russ Heath, Don Ulrich, and noted good girl artist Bill Ward. Most importantly, it included John Severin, an artist who would define Crack during most of its run. The first Crack cover was by Bill Everett, the legendary uh, timely artist who created uh, Namor, though Severin originally provided the layout. Severin was actually supposed to do the cover as well, but Sproul wasn't able to pay the same rates as Matt at the time. Though Severin would later do a fill-in cover for the second issue, making his official crack cover debut. By issue number 26, Severin did the entire magazine at 50 pages, minus one page Bill Elderid print and a subscription ad by Bill Ward. Severin was able to do this as he was fast and able to change his style depending on the content of the story, though he did prefer realistic images over cartoony ones. To disguise he was the only artist in the magazine, he crafted numerous pen names like Lapore, Norez, and Sigborn. Through this, Severin basically kept Crack running for decades, something everyone outside and sometimes inside Crack consistently stated. This pleased the owners so much he was paid regularly by them whether he worked on the magazine or not, despite not having an official contract. Severin did manage to own the rights to some of the series he invented to, for Crack, like Sagebrush and Hang Up, and he even colored his work at times, despite being colorblind. This would have resulted in some mistakes, such as a notorious uh, issue number 192 when he accidentally colored the character E.T. from the movie green over being brown. Despite this, Severn preferred working for Cracked over Mad as it provided him more freedom along with $40 a page. Plus, Severn reportedly hated working for Al Feldstein, and it is noted that he never worked on any of the EC comics he edited nor on Mad when Feldstein took over. Overall, John Severn would work at Crack for 40 years, providing numerous features and covers, and in 2012, Fanatic Graphics uh, co-publisher Kim Thompson stated in their, their obituary of Severn, Crack was mostly crap outside of John Severn. Saul Brosky would be Crack's first editor, leaving Atlas, the future Marvel comics, and stay with the magazine for the first 10 issues. Despite this short tenure, Brosky would help set up many of Crack's staples, including the magazine's three original mascots, the sexy lady with the cigarette holder, Veronica, the disabled magazine editor, Dear Editor, and the janitor, Sylvester P. Smith. The first two would be dropped after Brosky left, while Smith would remain the mascot of the magazine thereafter. As editor, Brosky uh, recruited numerous artists, many from the Atlas Implosion, like Russ Heath, Bill Ward, and Don Ulrich, with Heath later making a name for himself as a Playboy magazine under Little Annie Fanny Strip. Other early cracked artists included Carl Burgess, the creator of the original Human Torch, Marvel Comics' first superhero, and Bernard Bailey, the co-creator of Spectre and Our Man. Eventually, Martin Goodman at Marvel Comics, the former Atlas, enticed Brosky away with a lucrative offer to return to the Marvel bullpen, and he would take many of the artists with him, like Burgess, Bailey, and Basil Wolverton. Brosky would soon become a production manager of Marvel, and according to Stan Lee, his right-hand man. As for Cracked, Sproul looked for a suitable replacement and found him with their top writer. Paul Lankin, the magazine's top writer, took over as editor of Cracked magazine following Brosky's depart departure. Lakin originally wrote for Mad, working on issue number 32, April 1957, with the Bad Seat, a spoof of the film Bad Seed. He got the opportunity after Harvey Kurtzman left the magazine, thus leaving Mad without a writer, as he did most of it, and there were only artists on Mad outside of Kurtzman anyway. An ad was put out asking for writers, resulting in Lakin and Fred Jacobs answering the call. Lakin would even state he was Mad's first writer as a result of this. However, Al Feldstein, who took over for Kurtzman, was a tough editor to work for, and Lakin stated he didn't want to work that hard or be edited so much, thus he went to Cracked, 
where he joked there really never was anyone there that he could, that could edit. He took over as editor with issue number 11 at a rate of $400 a month, but most importantly, he liked the freedom of working at Cracked. Laker would end up writing for nearly every black and white humor magazine ever published, including Crazy and Sick. Despite his responsibilities, Lakin only came to the office about once a month, preferring to work from home, and even stated he felt he never felt overworked, as he couldn't have done it otherwise. Lakin also cleaned up the cluttered look of, of Crack Magazine, making Sylvester more friendly looking, with John Severin designing him to look like a Harpo Marx and Jackie Gleason across. Lakin also had the other two mascots drop, understanding Sylvester was enough. From 1960 to 1965, new artists were also brought in like Vic Martin, George Goddard, and Jay Lynch. Martin in particular had a long association with Lakin, working on numerous gag strips such as the uh, Hud and Denny about two prisoners always trying to escape from prison. The legendary Jack Kirby even worked on issue number 14 with George Goddard providing more features than any other writer. Goddard also had a celebrated career at Archie Comics, co-creating the character of Sabrina Spellman along with winning the uh, Bill Finger and Inkpot Awards. Which number 32, Gladier wrote uh, Getting the Gate 68, which predicted the JFK uh, being assassinated after his second term, and number 46, he predicted John Lennon's death. Naturally, both articles had never been reprinted. It would have a reversible fortune sometimes, though, such as in issue number 64 in 1967, when Crack mocked the New York Mets at the time considered the worst team in baseball, only for the team to go on to win the World Series in 1969. Lakin would eventually leave Crack Magazine for Sick, originally founded by Joe Simon in 1960, but would later return in 1985. Joe Kernan would take over as editor in 1964, running Crack till 1968. He sometimes also worked as an artist and writer. Lenu Herman also was an occasional writer, while Charles Rodriguez was an artist, and later Bob Sproul himself became editor and publisher in 1979. From 1965 to 1970, they, they were rather lean years for crack, and as a result, many of the issues are hard to find today. For example, issue number 38 on August of 1964 was only 44 pages, which would be the standard for the magazine to, until issue number 70 in 1968, when it was increased, increased back to 52. Reprints became more frequent as well, though the magazine still managed to bring in new talent like Oscar Blot, John Langdon, and Bob B.K. Taylor. On June of 1966, the magazine would attempt an animated feature with the flip side with Krantz Films, who previously produced the Marvel Superheroes cartoon for Marvel Comics, but nothing ever came of it. Krantz would remain busy producing the iconic Amazing Spider-Man cartoon in the 1960s, along with the Fritz the Cat, the movie. There was also an attempt to turn Crack into a TV show, but that failed as well. In 1969, John Severin launched the first uh, feature of Sagebrush about a prospector and his mule, and was his tribute to the Old West, one of S Severin's favorite genres. It became instantly iconic, running for several issues and even getting its own Crack Collector's Edition. Warren Sattler later joined for 15 years, and it was during this time that the magazine also expanded with special uh, magazines like Giant Crack Fun Kit, Greatest Biggest Greatest Cracked, and Crack for Monsters Only, among other issues, which were published by Ace Books, his parent company. Cracked eventually offered a $35 to $40 page rate to the artist, along with reprints and royalties, which was still lower than Mad, who offered up to $300 a page, though artists still came to the Crack due to the creative freedom. The magazine would later move its editorial office to Florida in February of 1971, starting with issue number 93, with the New York offices on Park Avenue serving as a warehouse and mail stop. Soon it would reach a circulation of 1.25 million, with Dell taking over the distribution before moving to select magazines in 1975. The magazine would later expand further with Crack the Collector's Editions, which ran 125 issues to the year 2000 and would even feature new material. During the 1970s, Jim Warren, the publisher of such popular black-and-white horror magazines like Creepy and Eerie, attempted to buy Crack, and while the sale never went through, it did result in Crack owner Bob Sproul attempt his own horror magazine with Web of Horror in 1969, though it only lasted for three issues. Warren reported that he was uh, planned to retaliate in making a humor magazine of his own, but decided it wasn't financially feasible. The magazine was able to attract new artists like Joe Cattiglione, Suzanne uh, Carmen, and Mike Rog Ricolaro, while also introducing features like The Great Memento. However, there will be no script credit until 1983 in Crack Magazine. In the late 1970s, one of uh, Crack's most enduring features, The Shut Ups, was introduced by uh, Don Orrick, who also worked with his wife, uh, Suzanne Whitley, on it. 
It was a two-panel gag strip in which a character makes an observation or an excuse in the first panel, only to be told to shut up in the second panel as the real situation was revealed. For example, one panel shows a man reading a restaurant menu in the first, only to be told to shut up in the second when it's revealed he's reading to an inmate waiting for his last meal before being executed. John Samuel continued to prove to be an essential cracked artist. So much so that his own children got jobs at the magazine, such as his daughter Kathy, who actually finished the cracked cover for her father when he had to undergo surgery. John Severn's other daughter, Ruth and Margaret, would also work in the magazine. Crack was famous for shamelessly following trends in pop culture, whether it be popular TV shows at the time like The Six Million Dollar Man and MASH, or movies like Star Wars. Sometimes it was too much, particularly with Star Wars, as they put it on the cover of the magazine so much they received a cease and desist letter from George Lucas. This did help keep them ahead of the mad, who was often months behind in mocking trends in pop culture. As one writer joked, we were making fun of Star Wars one month before, it was, before its release, while Mad took eight. In addition, while Mad would maybe parody a property once, Crack would do it repeatedly. Despite all this, Crack would receive a peak sales of 473,801 issues with the March 1978 release. Crack would also start using many of his classic cover catchphrases, such as the world's humorous funny magazine, Order Now, Chaos Later, and If You're Cracked and You're Happy. Another catchphrase was from the letters page of Crack was called Let Us to Our Readers, though they had a policy of never using kids' letters because they weren't old enough. During the 1970s, Crack would make an effort to, to move the magazine overseas. A British version was produced in the middle of the decade, mostly consisting of reprints from the original American magazine. In Germany, three magazines would carry crack reprints, the first being Kaput, which ran from 1974 to 1983, followed by Stupid from 1983 to 1984, and finally Panic. While the covers were original for all these magazines, the features remained reprints from the original crack. Brazil saw a version of crack with Panqueta from 1977 to 1980 under Editora Ibro, one of Brazil's uh, major publishing companies, who also produced versions of Disney Comics, Cosmopolitan, and Playboy magazines. While these features and covers were mostly reprints, they were adjusted to address Brazilian culture, from the political parties to the features changed to the local uh, arena and MDB, to football jokes for re- referencing soccer instead. Two attempts were made to also launch Crack Magazine in Australia, but they never succeeded. And with that, uh, we will conclude this first part of the history of Crack Magazine, but join me again next week we we go into uh, the 1980s, where Crack goes through a number of changes, ultimately leading to his demise. We gotta talk. Yeah, Thunder Talk. We're going all kinds of sideways with that sweet nerd junk. Woke nerd junk. It's topical. Political. Dare I say radical. We've got all your latest news and reviews. Hot music. And a whole lot of comedy. But it ain't for kids. Definitely mature content. So let's talk. Let's talk Thunder Talk. Thunder Talk is a proud member of the ESO Network. Now it is August 3rd, 2023, time for the favorite comic of the week, X-Men number 25 by Jerry Dugan and Stefan Casilli, which is a great follow-up to, of course, the epic uh, Hellfire Gala number 3 that happened uh, last week, in which the follow-up X has now started, and the uh, status of the X-Men and the mutant population on Earth in general has now been set to like the lowest it's ever been. The X-Men are on the run, many have been exiled to Mars, many, many are dead. And uh, this makes a lot of them fi- go to some pretty desperate straits to fight back, including Kitty Pride, who reemerges her own shadow cap persona and really shows how dangerous she can be when she wants to. Dugan does a great job just really setting up how big the stakes are now after the Hellfire Gala, how dangerous it is for mutants in general. And uh, Cassili's art is gorgeous, especially when uh, Kitty Pride shows up, just how violent with her phasing powers she can be and, and dangerous. So it ends up being uh, yeah, a pretty uh, good follow-up to the Hellfire Gala. It really sets up the, what we're going to be looking forward to the next few months, or not forward to, because, yeah, the X-Men are pretty low at this point. They've been riding out the last few years with the whole nation and everything, but this looks like they're going to be the, maybe the end of the Crocara era, but, uh, yeah... This, yeah, it looks like a nice epic, and uh, they, like they said, the X-Men's always, uh, in many ways, it's always the most enjoyable when they're at their backs to the wall. Well, their backs have never been further to the wall than this, so, yeah, fun read. 
And with that, well, first off, I'll point out, hey, an actual new episode. I am sorry for the long delay. Life gets in the way, and I, maybe I'm being too much perfectionist with these episodes, but um, I'm not. this is the first of 10 episodes I have banked for sure, and of course, I am researching more. But yeah, but uh, yeah, we're gonna, you got at least another 10 episodes of actual uh, episodes of my classic run. But uh, maybe you like the classics, maybe not. But hey, either way, join me again next week for the, for the concluding chapter of the uh, History of Crack magazine. And until then, go, and good, go out and enjoy yourself a good comic book.